Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Tracy Cook and I'm with SACS Healthcare Communications. I'd like to show our audience today how to send questions, which our speaker will address as many as possible at the end of the webinar. Please type your questions into the questions box. Our moderator for today is Christina Davis. Christina is currently an adjunct professor at University of United States in San Diego, California and Aspen University in Denver, Colorado. Christina has an extensive background in GI digestive disorders in both the treatment and diagnosis of GI and hepatic disorders. Her background includes clinical research through the NIH and FDA on infection related topics. Christina, welcome. Thank you, Tracy. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Tracy, for that very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is The Case for Minimally Invasive Hepatic Microwave Ablation. Speaking today on this very important topic is a leading expert in the field, Dr. Robert Martin. Dr. Martin is the Director, Division of Surgical Oncology, Director, Upper GI and Hepatopancreatic Biliary Clinic at the University of Louisville. His clinical interests focus on the multidisciplinary care and surgical management of patients with upper gastrointestinal malignancies. His research focuses on genetic predispositions to upper gastrointestinal malignancies. Dr. Martin has served as a principal investigator or co-investigator on numerous trials. He has written or co-written many articles, book chapters, and abstracts, and is a frequent invited lecturer. Um, I'm just going to go over the disclosures. Um, the speaker disclosed no relevant financial relationships associated with the presentation. Um, images and diagrams in this presentation have been developed and provided by the speaker, Dr. Martin. Um, and the opinions are the personal opinions of the speaker um, and do not reflect the opinions or, or views of uh, our sponsor Medtronic or SACS Healthcare Communications. And um, in order to get some con continuing education credits, uh, we'll be giving one AMA Category 1 credit. Um, a link to obtain your certificate will be available at the end of the webinar. And then for nurses, um, this has also been approved for one contact hour for nurses and a link uh, to obtain your certificate will also be available at the end of the webinar. Um, and support for this activity has been provided by Medtronic. And uh, I'm gonna pass this over to Dr. Martin now. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and again, welcome everybody. Um, I'm excited about um, talking to you about advances in microwave ablation and hopefully a, a motivation or potentially even plea um, to move towards that aspect. Um, significant advances have been achieved in the management of hepatic malignancies to which minimally invasive hepatic ablations is one of those. From this um, talk, I'm hopeful that um, I'm going to demonstrate to you hepatic microwave ablation in the surgical setting, review some of the evidence-based medicine, and then kind of give you a little bit of my opinion-based practice, where I think it plays a role, what should someone who wants to start a hepatic ablation program should think about, um, and then what are some of the minimum standards that are required um, to initiate that type of high quality type of microwave ablation type of program, uh, etiology, as well as uh, collaboration through a multidisciplinary type of approach. And then also understanding that in initiating that, there are well-established uh, standards for the use of this technology in multiple malignancies, um, demonstrating its benefits and equivalency to hepatic resections based on certain size and locations. Now, it's an incredibly exciting time to be focused in hepatobiliary malignancies. Um, as you can see here, the current therapies for hepatic malignancies continue to evolve. Um, some which are maybe falling off, some of those, some that are clearly rising. Um, surgical resection, both open, laparoscopic, and robotic, still play a critical role and obviously are one of the most efficient ways. Um, and most effective ways for removing uh, visible malign malignancies. Local regional therapies that can be utilized potentially for uh, downsizing um, lesions, 
as well as uh, the ability to bridge patients to either transplant or more extensive resections have also been utilized, both with transarterial chemoembolization, drug eluding beads, and radioembolization. Clearly, immunotherapies and the use of first, second, um, and even some third-line therapies have clearly demonstrated um, the types of benefits that can be achieved in patients. What I'd like to do is to go over what is the true volume. Um, some of you who may not have an ablation program, who are attempting to utilize one, or, or more importantly, want to grow one, I want to show you some of the informational data within the United States in regards to over a year time from 2017 to 2018 in regards to the uh, numbers that have been utilized for hepatic resections and ablations. 73% though, still in 2020, uh, are obviously performed through an open resection. Uh, our country has been slightly lagging behind that utilization of minimally invasive approach, either uh, laparoscopically or robotically. Um, however, you can see that a um, majority of ablations are performed, um, a, excuse me, a large percentage of ablations are performed in a small number of facilities. Interventional radiologists are still performing a vast majority of ablations, 55% but surgical uh, use of ablation um, is performed in obviously a various techniques of open laparoscopic or a combination of ablation and resection in certain malignancies. If we look at the true numbers over this one year time from March 17 to, two, uh, to 2018, you can see that the number of open liver ablations are a little more than 2,200 and that the use of laparoscopic liver ablations is only a half of that number. Um, but most importantly, you can see the significant number of patients who are undergoing percutaneous liver ablations. So the ablation need and the optimization or the use of ablation is clearly there within the United States and is clearly a area that further collaboration, but more importantly, expansion of patients who can offer, be offered this treatment is of critical utmost importance. Again, breaking down where a majority of ablations are being performed is in obviously interventional radiology through a percutaneous approach. Um, and surgery is still a smaller percentage, and that includes all types of techniques, as I've mentioned before. Now, what are the challenges to liver ablation? Um, and ultimately, it really comes down to patient selection. Um, if you remember nothing from this talk, I will tell you that patient selection is probably the single greatest factor that you as a treating physician can utilize in optimizing your quality of patients um, who undergo ablation, preferably a minimally invasive approach. Clearly, the disease status that you can see here Hepatocellular carcinomas is vastly different than treating colorectal liver metastasis. The type of liver parenchyma uh, can also obviously um, make a underlying ablation more difficult uh, or easier. And the location of the lesion, subcapsular, high up on the dome of the liver. And so clearly taking all of these variables uh, intact is of utmost importance to ensuring quality of your ablation. Now, the clearly most important around patient, after patient selection is obviously biology of the disease. Do you understand that? It's not really can you resect or ablate the lesion. It's really about should you do it. Um, what approach is best? So far in 2020, if we look at more of the major hepatic ablations that are being performed, our goal is, is to try and improve that to nearly 80%. In 80% of patients, those patients most likely can be treated in a laparoscopic approach to which we have demonstrated near equivalent length of stay, meaning a less than 23 hours, but more importantly, a much higher degree of staging and optimization of those patients. The biology of the disease and more importantly, the patient selection of that is 
do you truly understand um, that type of biology? Meaning, if you do an ablation, are you going to allow that patient to be in remission or disease stabilization for greater than six months? I believe, personal opinion, that it's a failure of patient selection if you simply do a procedure and then six weeks or 12 weeks later, you see clear progression of disease. That was probably not an optimal utilization of that therapy at that present time and where biology plays a role. As I said before, the hardest question is not can you, um, but should you do it? And telling the patient that ablation may not be the best option right now, maybe in the future, but getting a better control of their disease is of critical utmost importance to avoid unnecessary treatments. Patient workup and understanding that type of patient workup cannot be underestimated. Um, having high quality three phase liver protocols with thin cuts or dynamic MRI with the Avist within three weeks of the ablation is truly of, of utmost importance. I know many of you get pushback from insurance companies um, that they already had a CT scan, and it does sometimes take extra work to do that peer-to-peer, -peer. but I do find that having that short interval scan can ensure that a therapeutic ablation can truly be performed and that you are not going to be doing a non-therapeutic laparotomy if you're doing it open or a non-therapeutic general anesthesia if you do it laparoscopically. You start the procedure and you see that they have much more extensive disease. For hepatocellular carcinoma, understanding the radiologic signature is also important for patient selection. Our publication that came out in the Annals of Surgical Oncology in 2007 below demonstrates that there really are three different types of categories. Why those are important is about margin. Um, invaders clearly need a much larger degree of ablation margin than a, uh, a patient who has more of a pushing type tumor a well-circumscribed uh, tumor to where you can see the rim of that. A hanging type tumor is one you need to be more careful with, the type of ablation, because the access point and how you ablate it could uh, potentially put that at risk of rupture and seeding of the peritoneum. Radiomic signatures in hepatocellular carcinoma are growing, and I think being aware of that to allow you to predict the underlying biology, the microvascular invasion is of utmost importance. Obviously, the tumor location, their underlying uh, clinical uh, tumor biomarkers, and their child's pew status. Hepatitis status for hepatocellular carcinomas are critical to make sure that you understand that. And then obviously the short-term goals, and then what are the long-term goals? Will your procedure, will this ablation potentially burn a bridge six months down the road or a year down the road? I always tell patients, regardless of the malignancy, hepatocellular carcinoma, metastatic colorectal, uh, metastatic, I mean, uh, intrahepatic cholangio, metastatic neuroendocrine, make sure that you're truly playing the long game. It's not really what therapy they can be, that you, they can get right there. It's making sure you manage that type of escalation of care to make sure that your therapy is not going to prevent them from getting a therapy later down the road. And then obviously their underlying frailty, and what are the short-term and long-term goals of the patient? There is well-established ablation quality that all uh, physicians, regardless of their access, percutaneous, robotic, laparoscopic, must be held to. And these have been well-established and have been around since 2014. Must define ablation success. Ablation success for most of you seems fairly straightforward, but if you're not confirming that within four weeks of an ablation, then ultimately you're really not confirming ablation for sex. A local recurrence after an ablation cannot be called local recurrence unless you've had ablation success. It's impossible to call something a local recurrence at three months. If you didn't confirm that you had complete ablation at less than four weeks, that actually means you had an incomplete ablation and it just took you three months later to define that. Non-local hepatic recurrence is also important, especially with dealing with multifocal cholangio or hepatocellular carcinoma. And then obviously the indications for ablation, uh, understanding the morbidity and why this patient needs to be ablated versus why they potentially could not undergo re surgical resection clearly needs to be evaluated and decided upon in a group type setting in that multidisciplinary fashion. 
these quality standards need to be long-term, evaluating your da data at least every couple of years to make sure that your ablation success is reading, reaching 96 to 98% on all patients ablated, that your ablation recurrence is less than 10%, prefer preferably 5% is your ablation recurrence, and that your hepatic recurrence progression or extrahepatic uh, is at least six months or greater. And that comes back to the biology. It doesn't take a huge amount of work, I think, to get these things, but it does take that type of insight to make sure these type of quality standards are upheld. Now, what about the technical considerations? What about the fun toys? Well, what can we use to do this? And ultimately, I think there are three, three things that you need to be aware of when deciding how you want to embark upon an ablation program. And some of it is internal, meaning what is your ultrasound skill set? Some of it is the ablation device that you may have or may want to get. And then the third part is the biology. And this is a fairly simplistic type of estimation, but I do find it's very important for both my fellow trainees as well as my new faculty who I'm training in regards to understanding how to embark on a type of ablation program. Starting with your ultrasound skill set, on the left-hand side, truly being a critical evaluator of how good are you at ultrasound? Um, are you a basic user? And that means you wanna improve? Well, then that's good. That's nothing wrong with that. But you can see that a basic user trying to use a, a highly serotic hepatocellular carcinoma way up in segment A of the liver is going to be a very difficult, challenging, and maybe even frustrating case starting with the, your ultrasound ablation skill set, but also the underlying um, ablation complexity. Um, utilizing and evaluating normal parenchyma for small lesions, and you have an RFA machine, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that one ablation modality is better than the other. I actually don't really compare them. They all fit a niche of what treatments are available and where they can succeed the best based on location, type of liver parenchyma, the size of the lesion, and even the location of the lesion. I think aware of that is critical so that you can start in an appropriate fashion on this curve and then hopefully then grow your experience over time so you can get to be an expert ultrasonographer and an expert ablator. Um, these are truly things that can be trained and, and educated and gained through these types of webinar talks as well as other types of webinar talks. What about the technology? Microwave ablation has been around for a long period of time. I initially started to use it in 1996 with the uh, 915 uh, megahertz system um, and have moved along and evaluated from that. I find that ultrasound is quite advantageous with treating larger lesions, three to five centimeters. They are less impacted by heat sink because the majority of my ablations are actually for hepatocellular carcinoma. It makes up probably 70% of my case mix is hepatocellular carcinoma with the other 30% being metastatic colorectal, neuroendocrine and cholangio. Hepatocellular carcinomas are obviously very vascular tumors where a heat sink effect can play a role. And that's why I like microwave ablation because I can overcome that heat sink with the very rapid rise in temperature that you see here, which is one of the technical advantages over RFA if you're treating a larger HCC that may be closer to a heat sink type of vessel. I also like it because I use more of an active ablation and that gives you a much more rapid ultrasonography image, which can allow you to assess your ablation volume a little bit more accurately than that slow, more of longer term radio frequency ablation. Now, there are disadvantages. There is significant variability in microwave ablation devices, and I'll walk you through that in the next couple of slides. Uh, so buyer beware, not all of the devices are the same. They are not all set up the same. The technical demands of their utilization are not the same. And understanding that for the type of patients that you either are going to be referred or want to be referred is critical to make sure that you're choosing the right uh, machine. There is a wealth of literature. This is a smear summary of it around hepatocellular carcinoma, um, 
with again, local recurrence rates, some that are good and some that are not so good with small, with um, uh, certain types of lesions. Understanding that and when starting a uh, ablation program, maintaining that quality and following your quality, I think it's of utmost importance for patient care. Knowing the different frequencies of microwave. There are still a number of 915 microwave ablation systems out there. They work on a smaller power type of generator of only 55 maximum watts, whereas the 2450 uh, megahertz uh, generators can deliver up to 150 watts from the generator. Not all of that actually gets to the needle, and I'll walk you through that and why that's important. Again, for some of our audience who may not know how microwave ablation works, it basically just causes rotation of water molecules. That rotation, similar to your microwave oven, um, causes them to flip back and forth through this polarity very, very rapidly, which then leads to that very rapid and sharp microbubble burst that maybe some of you all have seen, but also that type of rapid heat transfer which is critical to obtaining that type of active ablation in a rapid period of time. Now, there are multiple types of systems out there. I am not going to walk you through which ones are better or worse because it depends on you. It depends on the size that you're going to ablate and the maximum size you're going to ablate. It's going to depend on the parenchyma that you may use. Um, and it also depends on your needle targeting skill set. If you're an advanced ultrasonographer, and you have no problem placing three lesions in order to ablate a three centimeter, a five centimeter hepatocellular carcinoma, then a multi-probe system could work very well. There are other systems that have similar types of wattage that are a single probe system. Some are water cooled and some are not. Some are even CO2 uh, uh, cooled for that. Those are more minor inconsistencies, but potentially could play a role around your nursing and how labor intensive your, it is for your nurses to set the machine up. I have probably not seen a more powerful factor that will actually shut down an ablation program is if the generator is so complex that it takes away from the nurses doing what they need to do in the operating room and can create a great deal of discourse when you're trying to do these cases. So thinking about the workload that requires while you're scrubbed, that is necessary for starting a generator is of utmost importance to make sure that a team-based approach is easier for everyone in the room for what you're trying to achieve. I don't wanna put you to sleep about talking about electrical engineering, but understanding the type of microwave ablation probe that you are purchasing is critical. If you don't remember anything from this slide, the only thing I would remember is identify where the sweet spot is on the probe that you are using. And this video demonstrates that. The sweet spot for this probe is actually right in the middle of the needle. That is not always the case. There are some probes where that sweet spot is here at the end, and there are others that are closer to the shaft here. That's critically important to make sure that you're obviously placing the sweet spot in the middle of the tumor, but you also need to be aware that if the sweet spot is down here, you may have to extend the needle beyond the target tumor and need to make sure that obviously no collateral damage has occurred so that you can place the sweet spot in that middle. Understanding active heating and passive heating. Active heating occurs in that immediate almost two to two and a half minutes as those water molecules are being flipped back and forth. Passive heating occurs with longer duration of microwave out to six months and is based on that type of passive energy transfer outside of the active treating zone. Understanding from your instructions for use as to how much you get in an active heating zone in a short time versus how much you're relying on a passive heating zone is critical. And why it is critical is also based on the water content of the liver parenchyma that you are ablating. A more fibrotic tumor and a more fibrotic liver parenchyma will have less water. Less water means less passive heating to generate that type of ablation defect. Also understanding just from the IFUs, 
These are publicly available instructions for use for a number of different types of ablation systems. I only bring this out there so that you understand there is some variability with microwave to understand that. And there is some variability. There is some variability in regards to the radial diameter of the ablation that can be achieved over the amount of time that it takes to achieve that. If time is something that you are not as focused on, then most of these are a pretty much equivalent. If you want a more efficient type of ablation, six minutes or less, which is sort of people say sort of the critical time point, then there could be other ablation uh, generators that may be uh, better suited to you for what your practice uh, demands and is interested in. The other is obviously the wattage that is available and the type of ablation that can be achieved. Um, the Solero system outlined here is a high power, 140 watts, six minutes, which can give you that type of ablation. The Amica system gives you a slightly similar ablation using less power, and that's related to the efficiency of how much power is being generated at the probe tip. You do lose some with the Solero system, which is why a difference in power gives you a very similar ablation volume at a similar time. Imprint, again, slightly different type of efficiency, but again, can treat these types of tumors. Single probe new wave system at a lower wattage will give you a slightly smaller and a more oblong like of ablation if you're treating a larger tumor. Aware of that is critical because the new wave system does allow you to place two to three, three uh, probes simultaneously to potentially get that type of additional uh, ablation volume if you need it. Um, that's obviously if critical to understand what happens at six minutes. At 10 minutes, you get obviously slightly larger ablations, um, not significantly larger with some of the devices, but obviously the ability to treat a three centimeter tumor far more definitively, both with the imprint system at 100, at 100 watts and what you see with a single probe new wave or a um, single probe um, smaller type of probe design demonstrating again, what size of ablation are you potentially going to focus on and that target tissue will allow you to dictate which uh, potentially device and probe would be best suited for your practice. Now, the optimal microwave technique is critically important on ultrasound. I can tell you there is no microwave ablation system that can overcome bad ultrasound imaging. You must know the quality of your ultrasound before you embark on this. It is critical for the optimal trajectory of your needle and to make sure that you are placing it within the longest axis. Ultrasound technology will also allow you to overcome challenges in histology, especially for a cirrhotic liver or for a metastatic colorectal cancer that has significant amount of cash type changes. And the type of parenchyma is also of utmost importance. And then you deciding from the instructions for use, are you potentially going to be an active and passive ablator, meaning placing one needle, planning on doing it for 60 minutes, meaning uh, trusting the active and then trusting the passive, or are you potentially going to be overlapping active, meaning doing multiple shorter ablations of two minutes and overlapping the, the ablations uh, lesion in order to get an equivalent type of ablation volume. That's a decision you need to make. Um, I have my biases and I'm happy to walk you through that. One case example will demonstrate my biases and why I believe that type of aspect. And this is this case example. You can see roughly four and a half centimeter um, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma who actually had four or five lung mets, was treated with upfront chemotherapy. The lung disease remained stable and actually went away and this was the only persistent disease. Um, we wanted obviously at least a one centimeter margin, a little bit less here just because of gallbladder fossa, but the goal was to attain that type of margin. I commonly will use a laparoscopic approach and do multiple overlapping ablations, starting in the deep part of the parenchyma so that I don't obviously obscure my imaging anterior, anteriorly or more superficially, and then pulling back and getting that type of active ablation. 
So four ablations of two minutes each is the critical piece that I do in order to attain that type of ablation volume. The optimal ablation technique in my bias, and just so I'll give you some of my opinions of this, um, is that I do believe that a laparoscopic ablation approach, when ablation alone uh, is planned for, is optimal. It is optimal predominantly because of uh, staging and the optimal staging, and it is optimal for ultimate targeting because you do have multiple um, access points to achieve that type of ablation. There is a caveat. Laparoscopic ablation is uh, technically demanding. It does it require you to have advanced laparoscopic skills, but those can be acquired. That is a trainable technique that once you establish where your skills are now, going through that type of stepwise approach and gaining experience can allow you to obtain that advanced laparoscopic imaging uh, technique, as well as that advanced laparoscopic ultrasound skill set. Both of these are easily obtainable if you stick with it and move through that educational process. Um, I do believe um, that again, a laparoscopic ablation is equivalent, and there is data out there that shows it is equivalent to open ablation, and we are finding that that disease-free interval quality standard that I mentioned to you, six months or greater, is actually superior for laparoscopic ablation than it is for percutaneous ablation. And that is not because the technique is better, it is all about the optimal staging. Laparoscopic is able to identify those other smaller lesions that may not be able to be seen percutaneously. Uh, again, that staging I do believe is superior to percutaneous. Um, the uh, uh, invasiveness is essentially equivalent. Uh, laparoscopic ablation can be performed easily with uh, three probes um, and a maximum uh, diameter of incision being uh, two and a half uh, centimeters in total length. Optimal hospital stay, a median of 23 hours, that is far superior to open ablation. And I do believe it has an optimal multidisciplinary care. It is not uncommon that nearly 70% of the patients that I perform ablations on um, are on concurrent chemotherapy. And we are doing their concurrent consolidative ablation on their off week from systemic chemotherapy. And then ablation recurrence, as I mentioned before, is where laparoscopic ablation is superior. As I tell people and you're embarking on it, make it easy. And what I mean by make it easy, start with a 12 millimeter probe here, uh, either a Hassan technique or um, varies, however you do it, but you need that 12 millimeter probe for your ultrasound. We then use a five millimeter camera. And then the only thing else I recommend is either a disposable or non-disposable two millimeter port that you should place in line as high as you can and you use that for the underlying directional torquing. I do not recommend that any needle or any ablation probe be uh, placed purely percutaneously through the skin. One, small incidence of needle track um, seating, but the other is around the torquing and placement of that needle. Having that type of port here allows you to take all the radial force off of the needle and allows for far easier placement and tracking of the needle when you're using the ultrasound. Choose, choosing an ultrasound ablation device that potentially even allows you to place the needle through the biopsy guide can actually make laparoscopic ablation much easier. And then laparoscopic ablation also allows you to have that manipulation so you can lift the lesion away from vital structures to make sure that collateral heat damage doesn't occur either to the duodenum, potentially to the gallbladder, stomach, um, as well as obviously vital um, portal inflow when you're treating more base type of lesions. So in summary, I know I've beaten the horse about patient selection, but I do believe it is critical to the success. Understanding the tumor size that you wanna start with, understanding the tumor location, and depending on where you live, the body habitus. I'm here in the Mid-Atlantic or uh, south in Louisville, Kentucky, and our BMI rates for patients who present with hepatocellular carcinoma and ablations are, is an average of 37. 
So it is a harder type of ablation than say for BMI of 25 or less. Know your ultrasound technology. If you don't know anything, make sure that it has a high definition um, image. Continuous ultrasound during ablation is required. It will truly allow you to confirm your uh, targeting is optimal uh, if you use that. Open a needle placement is obviously easier than hand assisted than lap. Hand assisted is not a demerit. Um, if you want to confirm convert from an open ablation technique to pure lap, utilizing a hand assisted technique is more than acceptable. And it sometimes can help you maintain that minimally invasive approach, which is clearly a benefit for the patient during their hospital stay. Thus, in conclusion, I truly believe after achieving these critical steps, you will have the best ab ablative uh, experience and more importantly, the utilization of that. Is there a best ablative device? As I said before, it all depends. It depends on you and your practice and your referral pattern and your multidisciplinary team. I do believe if the, you are asked to start with one ablation device, I would recommend a microwave ablation generator and needles because it gives you the greatest flexibility with a reasonable cost to grow your HPV program. Getting more advanced ablative, ablative generators and devices can come in time, but I think starting with that foundational piece will help you the most. As I said before, the type of a device is not going to improve your quality alone. You have to follow these steps in order to achieve these types of benefits. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. All right. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for a very informative presentation. Um, I would like to tell everyone how to get their certificate for completion. Um, so, like I said, the educational activity is approved for one contact hour. To obtain your CE credits, um, you go make sure you type in HTTP um, www.sactesting.com slash INIT. Um, you'll register at the site, complete the evaluation, and then upon su successful completion, you'll be able to print your certificate. And there will be an archive version of this on demand um, at www.initiatives.patientsafety.org. I'm sorry, slash patientsafety.org. Um, and an email will be sent out to everyone when it's available. Um, and then the on demand version will also be accredited uh, for physicians and nurses. All right. And we will go ahead and go into some questions. Um, let's take a look and see what we have. All right, one of our attendees, uh, Dr. Martin asks, do you do overlapping ablations? Um, if so, do you have a logarithm? I do. To further emphasize that, I, for lesions that are greater than two and a half centimeters in size, uh, I commonly will do at least one to three overlapping ablations. I think the critical technique of that is clearly start at the deepest portion of the lesion. Um, the hardest part about doing overlapping ablations is the repositioning of the needle for your targeting. So I always break the lesion into four quadrants. Um, start the deepest, whether it be left or right, um, or um, anterior or posterior, depending on the lesion it is, and then ablate the posterior aspects, which should allow you to potentially reposition the needle without a completely re-stick of the needle. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes you don't have to. You can just reposition it after you've pulled it back a little bit and then get that left or right um, overlapping. And then doing the same thing on the more superficial portion um, is of critical importance. Again, the reason for that is, is again, when I'm using microwave ablation, I don't truly know the water content within the tumor and within the normal parenchyma. And because of that lack of knowledge, the, the consistency of the ablation can have some variabilities. Um, we've looked at this when we initially started almost 15 years ago, when we were doing single needle stick ablations for patients and then did immediately post ablation CT scans the next day, the ablation volumes were variable and it really wasn't the machine. We were using the exact same machine. The one dynamic that was highly variable was the tissue parenchyma 
um, and the underlying uh, tumor uh, morphology. So I think having that in account is critical and you can overcome that by using that type of overlapping ablation technique. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and we have um, a similar question. Um, you may have covered this, but when performing overlapping ablations, how do you assess lesion coverage? I have trouble differentiating tissue on ultrasound once an ablation has taken place. It's a great point. Um, and I think that why it's one of the things that I do emphasize, obviously doing continuous intraoperative ultrasound from the time you turn the ablation on. The one thing about microwave ablation for pretty much most of the devices, you will get that type of micro bubble burst. Um, and that micro bubble burst will give you at least a rough outline of more importantly, where your needle is relative to the tumor, but also the ablation aspect. Within two minutes, you'll have a general idea of the ablation volume that you're gonna get with microwave. If you leave the uh, microwave on, or if you're doing RFA, after two minutes, I totally agree with you. The image ac um, uh, accuracy pretty much drops dramatically. And so after that, if you do that, then your repositioning is going to be slightly more blind, which is why I have a little bit of a trouble doing overlapping ablations when I use the single ablation greater than two minutes. So I'd recommend to you is maybe shortening your ablation interval, and that should allow you to get a little bit more image accuracy when you're imaging. The other critical piece to that also for image accuracy is your ultrasound technology. If you're not sure whether you have high definition imaging or if your imaging has not been optimized for the parenchyma that you're looking at, I try, strongly recommend that you work with your ultrasound, either rep, um, to make try, you're sure you can optimize that from a frequency aspect, from a gain standpoint, from a time gain function. All of these are small, subtle things that really can bring out that type of image accuracy and help you with that. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have a couple more good questions that have come in. Um, you mentioned playing the long game and ensuring the treatment is done in consideration for future interventions. Um, how does this relate to considering the larger ablation zones and ablation beyond the desired margin? Um, and then the second part, how do you weigh the benefit of complete tumor coverage and parenchymal uh, sparing? Excuse me. It's a great, two great questions. So um, the ablation volume and the size of the ablation volume, and what I mean by that is, is understanding the underlying biology within that ipsilateral lobe. Um, the one thing we do know is that I use, and I am a huge collaborator with hepatic arterial therapy and interventional radiologist. And so understanding what I mean by that is if you do a large ablation and there's concern that there's going to be another lesion higher up, deeper in the liver parenchyma, and you do a larger ablation and then they recur or that is an area that you can't get to, having a catheter-based treatment get around your ablation volume is gonna burn that bridge for that patient. And so it's that instance is really where I change the timing. If you think you're gonna need more regional coverage, maybe in the ipsilateral lobe, doing a more targeted low bar-based treatment, either with Y90 or with hepatic arterial therapy with drug-looting beads is sometimes that first step in regional treatment. And if the patient then has persistent viability in the larger lesion, then doing the larger lesion after that. We have found that to be very helpful and obviously enhances to make sure that we can treat all the disease, both that we can see and the disease that we may not can see, which we're worried about. The second part of the question about parenchymal sparing, I totally agree with you. Um, and we do this pretty much in all histologies. If we have a two, two and a half centimeter lesion that's stuck smack dab in the middle of the right lobe, between five and eight, and between five, seven, and eight. Um, is that resectable? Yes, it is. You could do a right hepatectomy on that patient. And I really couldn't actually you know, critique you that much. But what I mean by the long game is if you take that a much amount of normal parenchyma within the first six months of their disease treatment, I'm afraid you really are gonna burn a bridge potentially two years or three years down the road if they need that parenchyma to tolerate systemic therapy 
because they've developed lung mets or they've developed periportal lymphadenopathy and things of that type. And so awareness of that, especially in metastatic colorectal cancer patients, where we have patients living now years with their disease, making sure that we're not utilizing some of the parenchyma that they are going to need to tolerate that therapy at year three, at year four, and at year five, I think is important. And is the reason why we've seen here regionally an almost 40% drop in extensive major hepatectomies because of one of those factors, that being parenchymal sparing. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another good question. Uh, do you use color on the ultrasound during ablation? And do you have a specific technique for track ablation? So great questions. So um, yes, I do use color. Um, I do find that um, color is very helpful, especially prior to ablation, because it allows me to identify what potential heat sinking vessels may be near that, um, near that tumor. And if I have a heat seeking vessel, then I try and make sure that sweet spot is a little bit closer to that heat seeking vessel so that we are going to get a complete ablation. And I think that is a, a critical piece and sometimes that can help you a, a significant amount. Another sort of expansion and avant-garde use, which is still persistently in the United States off-label, is the use of contrast enhanced in ultrasound. We are the one, still the only country in the world that has not approved intraoperative surgical ultrasound contrast use. You can use it in radiology, and it's Sonoview or Lumison, but when you bring it to the operating room, it's considered off-label, and they haven't gotten through that. So just so you understand that, I do use it because I do find it dramatically improves our image accuracy pre-ablation. It also can help us post-ablation because we can do post-contrast ablation assessments after ablations and make sure that our volume truly meets what we wanted to see. I may have missed the second part of that question. Uh, I think you covered everything there. Okay. Uh, we have a few more coming in. Um, let me take a peek. Can you share your experience, um, if any, in using local therapies in tandem with one another? Um, for example, PACE plus microwave ablation. Um, and a second part, does a patient having been PACE impact how you choose to ablate? Great. Great, great question. So yes, for almost all hepatocellular carcinomas that are over four centimeters in size, we do use a combination of transarterial chemoembolization the day before and then take them to surgery right after. Um, having that immediate reduction, and we do it in a selective manner, so they're just treating the tumor, commonly with bland embolization. Patient will stay overnight, then get a laparoscopic ablation, and that has dramatically helped our ablation success and most importantly, our ablation recurrence. The reason why it's four centimeters or greater is that a lot of those tumors are, are potentially more invader type tumors to which the margins are not as well defined. And we found that that regional ablation recurrence when we looked at our data about eight, nine years ago was just not acceptable. So it's a common collaboration that we'll do in those kinds of cases. Um, if a patient has had prior Y90 um, or prior taste, maybe because they're treating five or six lesions in the right lobe or five or six lesions in the left lobe. We commonly do that a lot because we want to downsize that tumor. We want to downsize that volume of tumor down to three uh, lesions or less. Um, it doesn't affect our ability to do it. It's all based obviously on under the underlying liver parenchyma. Um, now, if someone got Y90 to the right lobe, I wouldn't immediately take them on for ablation a month later. You need to let the radiation therapy work, and that would be obviously a, a, a two-month or a three-month interval. Re-image them, assess the degree of response that you've had, and making sure that the Y90 has had time to work. And then we use consolidated laparoscopic ablation afterwards to eradicate and clean up any residual disease that the Y90 may not have um, taken care of. We find that to be very effective. It's well tolerated. And again, it's predominantly based on the underlying hepatic parenchyma and the patient selection that I mentioned. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another great question. Uh, thoughts on leveraging uh, microwave ablation as a bridge to liver transplant? I think it's a great idea. Um, more importantly, obviously with the new organ allocations, I do believe it's probably the number one 
best modality for bridging. As many of you all know, in the United States, you can't use surgical resection to bridge someone to transplant. Um, if I resect someone, they then fall off the list. But if I ablate them, they stay on the transplant list. And so single-handedly, I find, feel that laparoscopic ablation is a critical piece for bridging patients to get to transplant. One, because it allows you to survey the entire liver with high quality ultrasound directly on the parenchyma. And two, it allows you, if you do it right, to truly eradicate the tumor. And then the third caveat, you finally do actually get to see how good of a blader you are. Because when they have a transplant and the pathologist says there's still viable tumor there, you kind of feel a little less quality. So I think it's a good thing though. It's a great kind of what I call maturation of technique. And it will actually maybe even change your technique if you can, can work with your transplanters, understanding that ablation can be definitive, but you making sure that you're going to be graded on that definitive ablation when they finally transplant the patient. It's a it's a great piece of collaboration if your transplanters don't do ablation that I truly do believe is a critical piece in that multidisciplinary team. Wonderful, thank you. We just had another question come in. Um, popping causes a lot of concern during microwave ablation. Is this a valid concern? Um, do you have any techniques to minimize this? It's, uh, um, it's not a valid safety concern. And what I say for you. So as I, I and I don't want to downplay your concern, and I'm not trying to do that. I'm simply saying is is that it is not a safety concern. That popping is actually the rapid rise in temperature that you see, and you get that type of micro bubble burst. Um, as I said before, I've been doing microwave ablation since 2006, um, using multiple, pretty much all of the devices. And I've never had a safety issue related to that micro bubble burst. The only caveat to that, though, is if you are treating a surface based lesion, you can't just slide the needle just one millimeter below the capsule um, because that burst will cause it to, to do just that. It'll pop. So you do need to make sure that your needle is at least a five millimeters to seven millimeters deep in the parenchyma and then allow the sweet spot to then ablate that surface base lesion. That's the only area of concern that I think from a technique standpoint, you should be aware of. But other than that, I, I don't like to actually reduce it because the other piece of it is it also gives us that very rapid ultrasound confirmation that our needle targeting is hopefully in the center of the lesion, or in the side of the lesion if I'm gonna do an overlapping ablation like we mentioned about earlier. Wonderful, thank you. Um, all right, and I know you've sort of covered this, but we'll just go ahead and ask it. Uh, what is uh, your process for evaluating technical success of the ablation during a procedure? Right, it's a multi-step process. Um, I think the first step of technical success is prior to the ablation, you at least image in two dimensions. You image in your axial and your sagittal plane before you do the ablation and truly confirm that your needle is where you think it is. It's not uncommon when you're imaging one plane that you think your needle is smack dab in the middle of the lesion when it's actually way down at say six o'clock on a clock. To, um, and so understanding that for ablation success prior to turning it on is step number one. Step number two, follow your ablation through the entire six minutes or two minutes or eight minutes or 10 minutes, whatever ablation time you're gonna do, you need to constantly evaluate and look at that imaging to make sure that you're getting that type of passive heating out to the margins that you truly plan to get. That is one way to, as your signal, that I'm not gonna get it with one stick. I do need to overlap. I need to do one more here. I need to do one more there. And that's a critical piece of the success. Following that, then I commonly always get a triphasic CT of the liver with IV contrast only prior to discharge. I have never had an insurance company in the 18 years that I've been doing ablation deny that CT scan. It's an inpatient CT. They know it's coming. They commonly will do it at about 6 a.m. right after they get labs, goes down, quick CT of the liver, 
and that allows you to confirm ablation success. If I failed, I didn't get it, I've never had a patient not uh, like to hear that immediately post-op. The patients who are three months out and you say, oh yeah, I didn't get it, that is kind of soul crushing. If I get that CT and I didn't get it, and I'm like, darn it, I didn't get that, then I actually go up to the patient, I give them two options. One, we operate again that day and I clean up that margin. Or two, if it's an area where we can do hepatic arterial therapy to accentuate that, then I offer them that based on that aspect. Most 90% of the patients are like, let's do this again, I want it done. And we'll repeat the laparoscopy and we'll clean it up. So it's that three-step process that I think you really need to make sure you understand to get the ablation success that we believe is achievable for every patient. Wonderful, thank you. All right. Um, and any guidance when it comes to fellowship training for microwave ablation, best practices? Yes. Um, best practices, depending on where you are in your training, get ultrasound technique. Demand it wherever you are now. If you're still in your residency or you're still in your fellowship, get it. I find that gaining the ultrasound technique is the, sometimes the hardest part for obtaining a best practices for ablation. Um, if you're beyond your training, it's okay. Um, what I tell people is identify the ultrasounds that are available in your, in your hospital system, call the rep. Most of them all have disposable hands-on training modules that they can actually give you and that you can actually begin to use. It doesn't mean you'll be self-taught, but what it is, is, is the more you do it, the better you are. And so starting with that aspect, and then from that uh, aspect, use ultrasound on a lot of your cases, even your lap coli cases. Um, it doesn't cost anything to bring your ultrasound machine in and use an ultrasound probe. The only expense of that is if you stare at the probes, which when I talked to my, our um, chief financial officer here, cost about 30 cents. They're willing to okay that. It's not a big deal um, to use that. And then once you get that type of ultrasound skill set, you get that type of confidence, then evaluating and then moving your ablation into that will be so much smoother. Um, having that confidence and making sure that you have that type of technique, I think is a foundational piece, and then establishing the best practices and what you want to achieve with the laparoscopic ablations. Wonderful. I think we have time just for one more question and then we'll be done. Um, many of our patients are currently ablated in IR. Um, do you have any advice on how to change this so more patients are ablated laparoscopically? Quality. Follow, get the numbers of the patients that were treated in IR and see how well those patients look at six months. That's how we changed it. You look at the data. You can't pound on your fist. You can't say, let me play in the sandbox. You can't be, hey, I want to do these. That, that won't get you anywhere. But if you go back two years and you take the 10, 15, 20 patients that underwent percutaneous ablation and you follow them and what was their ablation success, what was their ablation recurrence, you will have foundational numbers. And if those numbers don't meet that paper that I presented to you, that's your argument. You want to improve quality. Make it a quality initiative. No one has any idea how well they did at something or how poorly they did at something if you never look at it. So look at it. Make it a quality initiative across your cancer committee or a, a, a potentially across a system and a, evaluate it. And as soon as people see the numbers, you'd be amazed how many people then go, well, wait a minute, all right, I probably shouldn't do that one. That should be done surgically. Oh, that's when I can do laparoscopy. And it becomes collaborative. You're not trying to steal all their cases. I'm not, I'm not telling you to do that because I get along great with my IR. Um, it's about identifying what patients that interventional radiology are really not going to be successful in. And those are the ones that you do laparoscopically. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we're right on time now. Um... All right, um, so uh, immediately upon conclusion of this webinar, uh, you'll be presented with an online survey. Please keep your browser open. Um, and then again, to obtain your CE credits, you'll go to www.saxtesting.com slash INIP.
And we'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And thank you, Dr. Martin and, and Christina. To obtain your CE credits, please visit www.saxtexting.com backslash INIT and register at the site and complete the evaluation. And again, thank you for attending. This concludes our webinar for today. And I wish everyone uh, the rest, a pleasant rest of the rest of your day. Thank you.